Okay, so we'll get started. Thank you all for being here and welcome. Um, welcome to Design at Large, the lecture series of the UC San Diego Design Lab. Welcome to all the students, graduate students, oh, faculty <laughs> and community members to Soft Structures and Hard Times, a lecture series co-organized with Professor Lisa Cartwright. I'm Maya Nichols, a member of the Design Lab community, and we're here on Zoom and in person at the Design Lab on the UC campus situated on Kumeyaay land. This public land acknowledgement serves to honor and respect indigenous peoples and their land on which our campus resides. UC San Diego was built upon the territory of the Kumeyaay nation. From time immemorial, the Kumeyaay people have been a part of this land. Today, the Kumeyaay people continue to maintain their political sovereignty and cultural traditions as vital members of the San Diego community. I'm very excited to welcome our second speaker in the fall series, Professor Simon Sadler. Professor Simon Sadler teaches the history and theory of architecture, design and urbanism at the University of California in Davis, where he's professor and chair of the Department of Design. His research examines ideologies of design since the mid 20th century, especially the roles proposed for design in political, cultural and economic transformation. He's the author of Archigram, Architecture Without Architecture, about one of the leading British architectural avant-garde groups between 1961 and 1970, and something of a cultural legend for redefining architectural practice. I was really excited about Professor Sadler's celebration of the graphic and inventive architectural imagery that emerged from Ar Archigram as something of an influential legacy in and of itself as evidence of process, regardless of the fact that their plans weren't always manifest. So Professor Sadler's work acclaims a moment when the city was understood as a living thing. Um, and they really pared down architecture, leaving in between situations. So their mid 60s move was one from megastructures, units and static supports to redirecting the economy through clip clip ons plugins and kits of parts. Professor Sadler recognizes the spectacular, banal and comic aspects of plastics and inflatables, forms of soft structures that change my thinking around the political power of intervening in architecture and design through culture with pop vocabulary, ambiance, irony, mounting critique in public space in ways that hijack cultural codes through the soft, which we will be exploring throughout the series. Professor Sadler is author of Non-Plan, Essays on Freedom, Participation and Change in Modern Architecture and Urbanism, and The Situation of City, which takes seriously the practices and modes of artists, such as through the use of diffusion or comedy as political tactic. And we are reading it um, currently in Teddy Cruz's, uh, uh, Professor Teddy Cruz's seminar as well, I should mention. So for any of you students who are tuning in um, on that. And he has written numerous articles, chapters, and essays about American and European counterculture. Today, Professor Sadler will revisit the Italian group UFO, a radical neo-avant-garde design and architectural group founded by architecture students in Florence and active between 1967 and 1978. This talk is also related to Professor Sadler's contribution to the first monograph on unidentified flying object for contemporary architecture. Um, recently published, and it's in dialogue with an exhibition that's currently on at uh, Flex Centre Val de Loire in, on until mid-January for anyone tuning in from Europe. Following the talk, I'll be posing some frameworks uh, in conversation with Professor Sadler before opening things up for questions from the floor. So for those of you who are on Zoom, please post your questions to the chat anytime, and we'll pose them for you um, at the end of the talk. For those of uh, us here in the room, Professor Cartwright will be circulating with the microphone. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Professor Simon Sadler. Thanks, Maya. That's a lovely introduction. And uh, thanks so much for inviting me to contribute to this series of talks. This is uh, it's quite, quite a big day out for me, this is, because I've one lot, long wanted to visit the design lab. Maya mentioned I'm chair of design over at UC Davis. You're probably thinking, what, there's, another, there's a UC at Davis? There's a design department at Davis? There is. And having seen uh, what I've seen here, I, well, I've got a meeting with the dean. I have a few words to say uh, to the dean when I get back. We need to step our game up. 
Um, and I think this is also the first properly in-person um, invited talk I've given since uh, before the pandemic, so I hope it goes okay. Um, I decided to tackle your theme for this series of talks by sharing with you some work I did on the Italian group UFO. I'm going to try and use the Italian, I understand the Italians call it UFO, um, in support of an exhibition and catalogue mentioned by Maya, uh, being curated at the FRAC in France by Beatrice Lampriello and False Mirror Office. I've done an essay in that catalogue. It's out soon, I believe. UFO was a design and architectural group founded in Florence and active between 1967 and 1978. UFO was reacting to the larger countercultural and neo-avant-garde scene of the 60s and 70s in Italy, California, and the UK. The group seemed to be asking how we can occupy and live in spaces and relationships colonized by capitalism. Its answer, as we look today at four of its sites, the street, party, recreation and retreat of my title, seems to have been to construct small dreamscapes. This is their, oh, hold on, we started there, in their office, you know, a very sort of surreal uh, scene. They seem to have been trying to construct small dreamscapes that threw the bigger dreamscape of capitalism into relief. Now, that was a tactic taken from Dada, surrealism, and allied anarchist Marxist politics. It also drew on a few more very different traditions, dreams, if you will, of civic life, communion, leisure, and safe spaces. And one way of assessing it would indeed be within the terms of this series of talks, the power of soft structures in design ecologies. Can we design situations that alter consciousness and relationship? Do we have in UFO a precursor, however problematic, to what we are now calling ontological designing? So a little bit of background. UFO are what historians would call a neo-avant-garde, part of the post-war West's second wave of experimental and radical creativity in the arts. If you think about this sort of interwar first wave being epitomized by the Bauhaus, the neo-avant-garde, are the groups that come after the Second World War. UFO was aligned with so-called radical architecture, a uh, famous Casabella uh, magazine cover there announcing radical architecture, formed alongside other groups uh, that you may have heard of, Super Studio, Archizoom, maybe UFO is the least known, at the University of Florence in the lead up to the events of May 1968, which of course rocked America and Europe including the so-called 1968 movement in Italy, when almost all Italian universities were occupied. Radical architecture, Italian radical architecture, was radical and cerebral in a way that many of its immediate UK and US influences, like Archigram that you see there on the left, were not. Archigram don't like radicalism, they don't like politics, and I've you know, had a troubled relationship with them for sort of trying to say, well, you know, there is a politics here. Uh, UFO is absolutely politically engaged, driven by dissatisfaction with post-war modern design and committed to societal change within a neo-Marxist and semiological framework. UFO wanted, I think, to construct situations rather than things. An ambition we can trace to the Situationist International, the SI for short, of the 1950s and 60s, which had a notable reach into the student movements and into Italy, as manifest, as you see here, in the disruption of the Milan Triennale Design Fair in 1968. Indeed, one of the tributary movements to Situationism, the so-called Imaginist Bauhaus of the mid-50s, had their meetings in Italy and conscripted a pivotal designer of the Italian neo-avant-garde, Ettore Sotsas, who we'll see in a moment. Situationism was perhaps the single most influential current of the neo-avant-garde. For all the diversity of experimentation at the Bauhaus, its lessons crystallized as a, method, as a methodical, problem-solving, efficiency-seeking geometry, which promised to tame the chaos of industrialization. Uh, satirical illustrations here from Situationist magazine satirizing the call to order in post-war housing and consumption. This was a rationalism that spread across the post-war world, 
from the architecture of post-colonial capitals to the housing projects of Europe and to domestic appliances. That management by reason started out as a deeply humanist project championed by the left and dedicated to the fostering of social progress and democracy. But the ingress of reason into everyday life, its sort of colonization for the sake of a bourgeois system was a particular provocation to the neo-avant-garde. So situationism had renewed the struggle inherited from surrealism for the unleashing of repressed desire in politics, art, design, society, everyday life. And UFO remained fairly faithful to that radical promise of helping its users glimpse something ephemeral, without a future, passageways. That's a, a situationist quote describing their ambition to construct situations. These, these temporary moments, right, when you feel alive. <laughs> I think we've all had them. Um, after the early 1960s, the situationists themselves didn't much pursue the construction of situations per se. They wanted nothing short of total urban revolution, a possibility seemingly adrift after the collapse of the revolutionary events of 1968. Whereas, it seems to me, the Florentine neo-avant-garde pursued the construction of situations, enabled by a technical aptitude perhaps in short supply in the Situationist International and in an agenda locating urgency more in the lived experience of the here and now of capitalism rather than its, Im its immediate overthrow. Okay, so what I'm trying to set up here is the idea that the situationists set up this idea to overthrow capitalist everyday life. They kind of fell short. 1968 fell short. And a group like U UFO is coming forward and saying, well, uh, we're going to try and continue the revolution in sort of micro situations. We will accept that capitalism wins this round, but we're going to kind of inhabit it and annoy it. And they will do this through, I'm going to suggest, four constructed situations. So this is a way of introducing four of the best-known UFO projects, um, which I think are bids to construct situations of sorts, Abandoning the formal and functional concerns of modern architecture and product design to focus on altered relations of the self, group, civilization, and time. That ontological bit. In these projects, UFO revisited four types of social space. The street, with a project called the Urbo Ephemery, which I'll show you in a second. The party, with the Bamba Issa, Di Bamba Issa Disco. So, right, these are like, you know, how if you go to a party and it's a good one, and you're just saying, oh, this is amazing. I never knew life could be this good. And then it goes. And I think UFO are trying to sort of trying to hold that moment. Uh, another project um, that they did that we'll see called the Giro d'Italia project. And finally, um, a country retreat they did with other neo avant guards who had collected as the Global Tools Collective. So let's take a look at these. This is probably UFO's best known work, actually. It comes early in their career, known as the Urbo Ephemery. These connected social spaces within the city, the architectural school and the piazza, to revive their radical promise as spaces of good disorder. So, you know, like there's that tradition, especially in Italian cities, of hitting the streets. In February 1968, UFO members joined the occupation of the architectural department at Florence University, and cooperating faculty provided a workshop for prototyping that, a polyethylene tubular inflatable object, and others like it, called the Urbo Ephemery, that the group deployed to help occupy the piazza in a demonstration against the Vietnam War. This is the most iconic, number five, resembling a giant tube of toothpaste declaiming Colgate Con Viet Cong. We'll get back to whatever that means. Sporting a stylized American flag arrayed alongside images of political activist Rudy Dutschka and declaring power to the students. So that's one thing we can be looking at. Uh, here's another. Somebody was asking me, what are you going to talk about at San Diego? And I'm like, Marxist disco. And they're like, that's surely not possible. Yes, it is. Here we the Bamba Issa Disco at the seaside resort of Forte de, de Mami the following year 
just fabulously incongruent, right? 68 and then 69, disco. But again, pressed art, surrealism, counterculture, and multidisciplinary experimentation into life. Disco was both an old and new type of social space, redolent of Dada and of the Berlin clubs of the 1920s or the Harlem Renaissance, while promising a riposte to Italian traditional culture. Its high concept themed interiors, which Ufo remade annually for the summer season, recreated an oasis with camels and sand. It was like a sort of radical adult Disneyland styled according to a 1950 comic book that you see on the right, Donald Duck and the Magic Hourglass, in which Donald Duck searches for the desert oasis of Bamba Issa in pursuit of supernatural sand for an hourglass to make him rich. Over three summers, recalls Ufo's Titi Macchietto, from whose hotelier father the commission came, the group offered, quote, an allegory for capitalism, its arrogance and shortcomings, as a continuous evolving story from the search for oil, allegory here, red sand, in the desert in the first year, to the colonization of the oasis in the second year, represented as an abandoned highway construction site in an African jungle with unearthed archaeological site finds. Uh, there's a, you see here, Anas, we will get back to that in just a moment as well. According to Macchietto, in the third and final year, inevitable systemic, systematic exploitation is addressed as the disco took the form of nearby Via Reggio's carnival tradition. Macchietto explains, Africa is rich in treasures, but now also filled with the colonizer's waste. And the only way the natives can earn a living is by selling us unnecessary trinkets and exporting them back to our shores. You know, like, you know, we're going to find a bit of dated language in there, but I think the sentiments are almost uncannily familiar. A third project then. So again, I'm sort of trying to sort of show you these strange episodes in UFO's career as they try to set up situations. Documenting bike rides and the road infrastructure that allows them, UFO's Giro d'Italia project seems to be at once its most arcane and its most straightforward. Named after Italy's famous bicycle race and shaped by contemporaneous developments in performance and video art, Giro ranged from a 1971 futurist reading performance at the appropriately futuristic Disco in Florence, known as Space Electronic, which had been designed a couple of years earlier by their friends Grippo 9999. Then published by In Magazine in 1972, followed that year by, I've got a couple of frames from this here, a barely watchable 30-minute video in which prota protagonists race inexplicably to an ANAS facility, only to linger there. And I didn't know what ANAS was until I did this, and I will tell you about it in a second. Giro was completed with a 1974 performance in Rome called Reverse Escape to the Territory. Reverse Escape to the Territory. What is this? I think it suggests Giro, this project, Giro's ultimate goal of encouraging us to char and reoccupy our rural hinterland. Other than its project to construct situations, the situationists had been famous for their appropriation or diversion or detourment of existing materials and for drifting, as they put it, through space without aim or destination. And there's a bit of a drift going on in this video and in the documentation of it. In Giro, UFO members seem to be drifting through the urban and rural territory and it's in between, the A to B, as they call it, for pleasure, but also as though on reconnaissance. The roads of the Tuscan countryside so troubled by automobile traffic in the video they made. Can these be diverted or reclaimed? Might cycling itself be reclaimed from its stigma as fascism's preferred sport? And with it, ANAS, the state corporation founded by the fascists to maintain the roads and a persistent symbol of bureaucracy and, con and corruption. Uh, this is part of the Giro project, I guess, but it's an Anas inflatable hut as a sort of soft sculpture um, in the middle of Florence. 
Giro dispassionately documented the terrain plotted by Anas buildings and pylons in a photographic survey that kind of reminds me of uh, Hiller and Bernd Bescher, their work from the 70s of infrastructure. And then this is the fourth project. I thought, you know, we can, it's a thing to think with, right? If we want a conversation afterwards, like what's going on? A fourth one, seemingly at odds again with both its street and party projects and its cycling project. UFO were among the founders of this collective, Global Tools. So interesting. Global Tools is so interesting. Um, so we will be touching on that. A multidisciplinary collective and experimental program of design education launched in the editorial office of Casabella magazine in 1973. Over the next couple of years, the Global Tools Group issued a series of remarkable bulletins deconstructing the relations between design education, industry, nature, subjectivity, and the environment, with a few attendant and deeply curious designs, such as constraints on bodily movement, that you're seeing here, the outcome of a workshop held by the collective's body group in Milan in 1975. Now that isn't one awkward, they are definitely in each other's personal space there as they slot their feet into these casts. And over on the right, that's Ettore Sotsas, who we had been on the fringes of situationism. That Milan meeting captures the situational quality of global tools and what it called territorial proxemics, practiced to in a series of communal encounters among group members. A 1974 boat trip on the Rhine, I think it's like the very boredom of this boat trip is something that's trying to enforce like some sort of encounter. And a meeting at a country house between Florence and Milan in a town called Sambuca, I think you, you pronounce it, also in 1974. It was as though Sambuca completed an arc of neo-avant-garde workshops beginning with the Situationist, the Imaginist Bauhaus in the 50s. And indeed, Global Tools is kind of like the coder of that. It's kind of melancholic. I think people involved in Global Tools knew it was coming to an end, that that idea that designers don't work for industry, but they just hang out, uh, ends <laughs> at this moment. Um, it's certainly the end of radical architecture. So I'd like now to turn to a couple of objectives I discern in UFO's design. Um, I'll begin with communion and then look at open work before concluding with some thoughts on why UFO design might be interesting to design practitioners now, as well as to historians, well, like me. So I'm going to be, I, I will make sure, well, I'm going to try and keep an eye on the time. I can always cut this short, but let's see if we can bang through uh, something about communion and um, open work. So communion first. I mean, Ufo's work is uh, super ironic, right? And I think that emphasis on irony, it's almost like an embarrassment. It's like a cover for something that is really about love and communion. These are things we can't really talk about as good postmodern subjects. Um, I think what I'm going to be finding in these slides is like a sense of godliness. The Duomo, the backdrop, right, of uh, that inflatable was literally the background to the Ubo ephemery, the perennial sacred heart of Florentine society and the setting for a quasi festival. A few years ago, Lapo Bonazzi from UFO told the New York Times, oh, we were inspired by the feasts of the, of, of the Renaissance. There was a quasi-monastic quality to global tools as well. It's sort of designer monks learning to till with one another and with nature. The disco was a quasi-religious revival as well. Congregation, light, sound the ecstatic body, an altered temporal and historical consciousness known to churchgoers. Okay, a sidebar, I totally shouldn't do this because we haven't got time, but um, you can now uh, get um, the, the movie footage of Aretha Franklin's filming of her gospel album. 
it is intense, folks. This is an hour and a half well spent. And I kind of, I think I want to try and loop back to that as a kind of social space. Um, it's something about the relationship between music and group form. Anyway, I'll see if I can flesh that out a bit. Um, yeah, so instead of live acts, they didn't have live acts at Bambarissa, which is uh, was typical of other clubs at the time. Instead, Bambarissa hewed to a notably mellow playlist of soul and rock records delivered through eye-wateringly expensive Swiss sound equipment. So whereas in the streets and at the retreat, Ufo opposed or withdrew from capitalist modernity, Bamba Issa fascinates me because it's absolutely in the belly of the beast, right? It's the forerunner of the orgy of consumption and hedonism that is today's Mediterranean club scene. Bamba Issa's pop iconography called out this unholy mix of capital, the popular and the transcendent, which stretched back to Renaissance Florence's dependency on banking. You know, there's always that sacred and the profane, right? Strikingly, Bamba Issa's playlist was mostly Black American. It would have been featuring um, Isaac Hayes, for example. The secularization of gospel as soul music, the expression of faithfulness to God repurposed as romantic and sexual devotion, had been the cause of some consternation among Black churchgoers in the 50s and 60s. Complicating things further was the relationship of soul music to commerce, to capitalism. Was soul music a form of transcendence of and resistance to racial capitalism or a sellout to it? So it's like, you know, in black music at the time, there's this same conundrum. How do you survive within a game whose rules you have not set? This dilemma was baked into the history of R&B music, and I'd like to suggest that the intersection of godliness and secularism, community and commerce, is also a way of interpreting the otherwise overwhelming irony of a space like Bamba Issa. Because UFO projects were doing their best to mitigate life under capitalism and restore lived experience. It's like sort of desperate, right? We've got these four situations that I've been trying to introduce to you, and they're all different. It's like panic. Well, we'll try this. Okay, we'll try this, this, this. Street, party, recreation, retreat. It was a romantic bid to reverse the repressive apparatus of modernity, what sociologist Max Weber famously called the iron cage, into an apparatus of liberation. Consider the disco with its pounding music. Was it an archetype of what Marxist philosopher Herbert Marcuse was causing was called was calling repressive desublimation? In advanced industrial capitalism, Marcuse argued. Culture is flattened out into a commodity and technology, denying its capacity for opposing and transcending society. As he put it in One Dimensional Man, the music of the soul is also the music of salesmanship. That contradiction, that paradox. Flip that, though, as Marcuse would imply was possible in a follow-up book, The Aesthetic Dimension. And one might have instead a liberating sublimation. Philosopher Michel Foucault, theorizing the ways that individual and social bodies are disciplined, surely would have considered the disco an example of the dispositif, his term referring to the institutional, physical, technical mechanisms that maintain and enhance power. You know, so we could dismiss discos as hedonistic self-absorption, you know, amid the, the light and the beat and smoke and the bodies. But could these technologies of the self, another Foucault phrase, become technologies of the non-self? Could the disco be what Foucault described as a heterotopia, a space in which to live out something other, a world within a world, another way of being together? And now, before I lose this, I've made a note to myself here. This is delirious, but I've written here, notes to Christmas tree. And... Um, I don't know whether it's Christmas at Bambara, so when this picture was taken, uh, but in a moment, I'm going to uh, switch to the most iconic of the loft parties of the era, David Mancuso's loft party, where famously he had a Christmas tree year round. And I've, I've, I can't help wondering if they knew, but who, who's to say? 
So probably all of the above, right? It's both money and love. Bamba Issa foreshadows the postmodern both and. We know this, right? Our lives imbricate, imbricated in an economy. It was an alternative state deconstructing global capitalism and just a bar, just to pick up joint, just somewhere to space out. We probably shouldn't underrate the importance of experiments like this post counterculture. The heterotopic refuge, often identity based, queer, Latinx, punk, punk, black, and so on, became the constructed situation of the era with lineage traceable to the intimate clubs and safe spaces of Berlin, Harlem, and Paris in the early 20th century and late 19th century, where they'd carved out space and time from the night, rested by electricity from the old diurnal cycle. There is abundant testimony of the freeing experience of such spaces. Parties were refuge for the oppressed and marginalized. Afro-Caribbean sound systems in the UK, for example, and gay bars in San Francisco and house music in Chicago and New York. In 1969, the same year as Bamba Issa number one, David Mancuso started his legendary Lower Manhattan loft party. DJ Frankie Knuckles, who you see in the top left there, recalls it as being, quote, a religious experience in a space furnished with church pews in what was actually Mancuso's own home. He'd invited people home. Knuckles, quote, knew I was home. There was all sorts of people in there, black, white, gay, straight, Latino, this, that, and the other. There was a rhythm that was moving through the room and you found that the minute you stepped into it, you went right with the rhythm of the whole room. End of the quote. Bamba Issa might be something like a Mediterranean ver variant of this church, this home, slipped laconically into the confluence of capitalism and Marxism, <laughs> assuming there is such a thing. In the nightclub, everyone was on stage, not so far from the experience of the piazza then, right? You know, you're in a crowd. We're all here. The caressing of the lighting, switching from the individual to the collective, subjectivity to intersubjectivity, self to non-self. Um, there's David Mancuso on the right. Um, in, in, the, in, the, in the loft party, you wouldn't see him for hours, and the parties would go on for eight hours, ten hours, and he would be behind the console. He would never kind of reveal himself. And in fact, uh, uh, Knuckles said that he went around the back of the console once, and Mancuso looked up and he said, he looked like Jesus Christ, I swear to God. And there he is. I was trying to find photos of the Mancuso loft party. Mm -mm. No photos. That was part of being at the party. You're not there to photograph it. You're there to be the party. I can't remember why I slipped in the next thing. I think I was writing the talk. And... And this tweet kind of popped up and it just seems to speak, right, to the possibilities of this other way of designing. This ontological plenitude could be high-tech or low-tech. In his 1973 book, Tools for Conviviality, anarchist philosopher Ivan Illich would identify the bicycle as one of those popular tools that, quote, Foster conviviality to the extent to which that they can be easily used by anybody as often or as seldom as desired for the accomplishment of a purpose chosen by the user. In opposition to the dissociating effect of the automobile seen in the background of the Giro video, the bicycle was lightly functioning in something like this role for UFO. And they kind of continue that convivial uh, trend with their new craft laboratory, uh, which ran from 1975 to 1985. You see the storefront there, which would add things like lamps and picnic gear to the stockpile of convivial tools. These were things that then you could use to go and construct your own situation, go and have a picnic. Illich's equally infamous book, Deschooling Society, 
was an influence on global tools, whose rusticity was seemingly so at odds with Bamba Issa, but was actually another natural progression for UFOs concerned with lived environments, ease of access, you know, popularity, technology, and the in-between, all beyond immediate monetary exchange. Illich argued that the industrial mode of production and its expertise, its medicine, energy, education, had become irredeemably damaging to people and the environment, and that the concentration of power, energy, and technical knowledge in bureaucratic systems disabled personal and collective autonomy and dignity. Global tools followed suit by positioning design as an act of self-directed learning and community. Quote, a new style of educational relationship between man and his environment, gendered there, but uh, that's how Illich put it. Giro and Global Tools concurred that Ill with Illich that the physical environment was a freely available resource where people could learn on their own terms. Global Tools sought what it's called territorial proxemics hailing the proto-discipline of environmental proxemics developed by anthropologist Edward T. Hall to track the interactive human choreography of crowds, workplaces, and the like. <clears throat> My colleague and friend Larry Busby has some amazing recent work about this, by the way. I urge you to look it up. Edward T. Hall and proxemics. Some architects were optimistic that proxemics could improve their capacity to design lived space which was otherwise so ineffable. I mean, it's as soft as it gets, right? A tangle of actors and ideas and technologies and context. Hall tried and ultimately failed to offer architects a scientific notation system of the way that we relate in space. Whereas UFO and their colleagues experimented in effect upon themselves, rescinding the possibility of objective, predictive, behaviorist view of subject environmental relations, self to other, mind, the mind and body as a dualism. There's a sort of low cunning to this. Um, a memo from Global Tools explained the rationale for moving the group's workshop away from Florence and the Space Electronic Club to a country house as a way, quote, <clears throat> that can lend itself to the organization of an encounter that keeps everyone in close contact. Oh, I'm just now thinking of Elon Musk saying why he, he hates public transport. You don't get to choose who you sit next to. No, dude. It's public life. <laughs> it's other people. The organization of transportation and communications, cooking, cleaning, and sleeping becomes real-time action. And together with various other manual activities like construction and working with the earth, these activities constitute with the reports and the discussions, the object subject of the days of the workshop. So the Global Tools Workshop in effect completed an arc of Italian neo-avant-garde workshop situations, beginning with those of the Imaginist Bauhaus with artists and designers just hanging out, producing not much in particular. Okay, folks, so this is kind of the last stretch here. Um, and I've got some conclusions, but we could kind of, well, we'll see how we go. Um, and the last stretch is to think about this work as open work. So in other words, what I'm trying to get at here is the way that these situations don't have a single identifiable author or outcome. They're open. So as, as I was saying, UFO worked hard ironically, to design situations in which everyone could seemingly just like loaf around. The refusal to work for capitalism had been central to the situationists and was imported into global tools, I think probably from Italian workerism, operismo, becoming central to a report to global tools by Ufo's Lapo Benazzi, who you see in the upper left-hand corner here. Operismo refused the invasion of society by the logic and methods of the factory. Following suit, designers in global tools would decline to produce market fodder for today's, as they called it, consumer force, the adjunct of the workforce. 
Further, Global Tools refused the invasion of its factory, so to speak, by the logic and methods of capital. After all, it is commonplace that the sort of work that a lot of us do post-industrial uh, is based around creativity, and usually there's uh, some sort of you know, profit outcome for that. By refusing to work for capitalism, Global Tools would be an instance of what they called pure creativity eventually freeing society of predetermined consumer choices. Binazzi believed that in global tools, there would be no difference between theory and practice. Imagine designing instead as itself being a situation of sorts, a pure state of being. I'm going to do a sidebar again here because we're in a design school. And I come from a design school. And you know that sense sometimes that just being here, is kind of fun and you come here and you hang out and you relate to others and you make things and prototype that there is sometimes that moment of, of sort of suspended in just pure being. And it, it makes me think sometimes that the discipline is kind of like a situation. Uh, we can't, well, and then we're told, well, you've got to say what the outcomes are. Okay. The outcomes, the refusal of work also implied the refusal of culture of society's prevailing moral, religious, economic, and aesthetic meanings and values. Binazzi instead posited the radically open work of creativity and communications without category or allegory, a sort of pure being in which there is no longer a division of labor nor an industrial system of communication. The name UFO, which we haven't really thought about yet, unidentified flying object, had been intended to convey instead an anonymous and open structure. This open structure was both technical and semantic, Bamba Issa bombarding the subject with recorded and amplified sound, video, strobes, and mind-altering drugs. What now was designed was less objects extending us by use and more environment, a key word of the 60s and 70s, in which in a sense, the user is the extension of the environment. It's like the background is the foreground. This new environment was prototyped uh, in San Francisco's psychedelic 1966 Trips Festival up there on the left and developed, developed further in the Italian clubs designed by UFO's neo-avant-garde colleagues like the one that you see on the right. That is Space Electronic. I've mentioned it a couple of times. It was one of their major hangouts. The new postmodern ontology with the individual a relay of stimuli was theorized in systems and cybernetics theory, which described the world functioning as something like a nervous system with no absolute separations, no single author, no single architect, no distinct substance, soft. That could be the case semantically as well as technically. Semiologist Umberto Eco was one of UFO's professors at the Faculty of Architecture in Florence. He was famous for what he termed the open work, and in a celebrated lecture in 1967 towards a semiological guerrilla warfare, he argued that means of communication, unlike means of production, are not controllable either by private will or by the community, right? So they're open. That being the case, he asked the scholars and educators of tomorrow to abandon the TV studios or the offices of the newspapers to fight a door-to-door guerrilla work battle like provos of critical reception. I think that was the task being assumed by UFO, instigating critical reception through multimedia events founded as Binazzi put it, in discontinuity. They don't make sense. Two 1966 pop countercultural events, the Trips Festival and Andy Warhol's multimedia exploding plastic inevitable served as models of this sort of new environment. If Trips Festival-style psychedelia offered its party goers the dream of being made one through immersion in media, and if, by contrast, the exploding plastic inevitable, ah, oh, kind of, it's a downer, really. It explodes the dream. Bamba Issa, I think, is encouraging something in between. A dream open 
through its own lampooning, lampooning to ongoing critical consciousness. It kind of knows it's silly, and you take it from there. Change the conditions of reception, and the meaning of the message changes, Echo explained. The urbo ephemery, what did they mean? I think I'm a slide behind here. Let's go there. There we go. A form of pop art for sure, the toothpaste tube. But the chain of signs, Colgate, Viet Cong, the Stars and Stripes, Dutchka, it's like a, a Marxian dream image. Like uh, the, the empire, man, it's, just, it's, it's all there. Bamba Issa's oasis still more so. What is this? If we can safely assume that alcohol and drugs were central to Bamba Issa's party atmosphere, the ecstasy of the situation was derived too from a tension between the body and mind. Ufo was putting meaning and ambiguity into a dialectic of modern life that's been, you know, it's so familiar to modern art. It was familiar to Cubists at the turn of the century as they navigated a flood of print media available to them at the cafe. You know, there's like so much media facing the cubists that it doesn't kind of make sense and they roll with that with synthetic cubism so that the image is sort of whatever you think it means oh there's an instance okay in the top left hand corner the disco was something of the cafe's successor social space with no central image activity or narrative unless the patron of bamba issa was sufficiently sober to be reminded of their dependency on a glut of energy derived from a capital, from sorry, a global servitude of bodies and nature under capitalism. I think ultimately, if you sober up at Bambrissa, it's awkward. Who am I? What is the global system upon which this is dependent? So I think I will um, wrap up with um, a few conclusions. I've got like long conclusions, but it's possibly better given the time to keep the conclusions short. And then if people want to kind of conclude for themselves, very much an open work, uh, we can have a discussion. So my conclusions. I've presented UFO's pursuit of communion an open work as a possible case study of the power of soft structures in design ecologies. Ecology here meaning, you know, something like that open work, I think. Well, there's two, two in, it's sort of eco in two ways. One is you turn up to an UFO, an event, and you don't really know what's going to happen. It's a sort of social ecology. Um, ecological too, in so far as there is this sort of proto-ecological uh, complaint at things like Bamba Issa saying, folks, oil, we need to talk about oil. Um, anyway, at the top of the talk, I said I'd close with some critical thoughts on why UFO design might be interesting to design practice now, as well as to historians. So a bit of a mouthful here. I've broken it down in bullet points. What I guess I'm wondering is, do we have here sort of proto-ontological designing. It's critical. It's uh, autonomous, like it's trying to separate itself from any client, per se. Um, it's communal. It's very postmodern. It hacks tools and technology. I think the thing that I like about it the most is that it draws on popular and cosmopolitan situation design. There's a sort of vernacular here from feasts to discos. And I think along the way, that kind of encourages the discipline to look more inclusively at what constitutes design. Maybe it doesn't all ha happen in your department or my department. Maybe people are doing things on the street. Um, Decentering authorship, revealing structures of feeling that are potential gateways to changed human and material relations. Structures of feeling, if you know that phrase, it's a Raymond Williams phrase, the Marxist literary critic, very controversial, uh, in which Williams posited that sometimes we can kind of feel 
a politics before we're able to articulate it. It's a vibe. You can feel it coming. And I'm wondering if UFO is trying to instigate that vibe, that structural feeling. Maybe after Bambarissa, you go and say, yeah, oil. Um, so that's a lot of conjectures. Uh, but if I've put a few pins in things there, then maybe we can pick them up in discussion. And I think I'm going to wrap up there. So thanks so much for listening. That's really appreciated. Thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, you really touched on some things that we've introduced throughout the series and last week. Um, there's so much there that we can dive into further and then we can obviously take questions. Um, I think um, foremost that's at the top of my head right now is in the very start of your talk, you were mentioning how um, for situationists, so I guess, if you could elaborate a little bit on what you see as the distinction between situationism and UFO, because I feel like there's such similarity. And for people that are more familiar with situationism and their sort of mentality, what are the sort of key distinctions that you would um, articulate there? And then the other thing I would really like to talk more about is also just the use of plastics as this disposable, how does it change in terms of the temporality of the plastic form? And what it, what are they saying about consumption by using plastic, um, thinking through the actual materiality of it and its, it's um, obsolescence and its implicit obsolescence as a plastic structure. Um, also thinking about that in terms of, you know, um, today as designers are facing questions about how to design structures, um, you know, something about this, what was their sort of ethos around consumption, I guess. That's um, okay. We've got two questions there. So one with the situationists, we could sort of work backwards from this. I think the situationists would have hated this. And the reason for that is that what it does is captures the idea of situations back by can I say, sort of folks like us, designers and architects. Now, there had been designers and architects in the Situationist International, um, and Etre Sotsas, who, if you don't know Sotsas, you know, he's really the, the one of the sort of uh, pivotal figures of Italian design after the Second World War. Unbelievably interesting, mer mercurial character. And so he had been in the Imaginist Bauhaus that, Proto situationist group. As the politics of situationism became more and more shrill and divisive, um, there's this letter that Etre Sotsas writes. It's very sort of ironic. He says, A group full of geniuses like you is, is, is more than I can deal with. I'm, I'm not quite as brilliant as the rest of you. I'm out. But really, what's happening at that point is the situationist international is trying to become really something like um, an international revolutionary organization and trying to distance itself from art and culture from what we would call the neo-avant-garde. And they are saying, you know, you know what a situation is? It's going to be something like um, an attempt at the overthrow of the state. And to disbelief, in, probably including their own, that kind of nearly happened in May 1968. So that's what the situationists are reaching for at that point. After that, what you see in UFO is like, well, okay, um, can we kind of be a bit more kind of professional, if you like, than the situationists? I don't think they have, I can't recall them ever talking directly about the situationists, but there's this sense that. Um, it is uh, a, a, a revolution prematurely ended and that designers and architects and artists can still help intensify this quality of everyday life and that Marxism can take other forms, postmodern forms, where you start to move into the apparatus of media, try and kill it from the inside. 
So I think it, you're sort of looking at a sort of second generation with UFO. Right, plastics. Why didn't I think about that problem? And at what point do we know that plastics are a pretty bad in idea environmentally? Well, we sort of do know by this point. Victor Papanek would have been telling us. We know. And so one of the things you get then with UFO is this delicious contradiction between wild consumerism. Actually, I've got something I could show you. I don't know whether this clicky thing, because I've got some spare slides, which you'll be relieved I didn't show you. There we go. Um, this is one of their um, most successful products. Ufo did this table lamp. I, lo I love this because it's really explicit about the relationship between design and consumption. If you like the lamp, awesome. You can see exactly what is involved in the exchange. It's, it's revealed. Um, so they have this relationship with consumerism, consumption, late capitalism, that's very kind of laconic, in which when they are participating in it, they kind of call it out. Uh, but they're also trying to find ways of not participating in it. So they will pivot from something like that to global tools where there is nothing for sale. It was a weekend digging things and well, there they are. They're hanging out and I just want to, now I've got this slide. I've just, I can't resist showing it to you. Um, because uh, what you're getting in that slide on the right is it's actually calling out, you know how human relations, you may have experienced this, are often kind of tense. <laughs> so on the one hand, it, it's a this is at Global Tools. It's the lunch table full of lovely Italian food and wine. But if you look carefully at the corner of the table are two guns uh, describing the tensions in the group as well. And this is, as, as well, maybe an oblique reference to the slide of Italian politics into the years of lead, as it will become unhinged in the 70s. But again, constantly kind of like getting us to think about and talk about how we relate to each other. But anyway, the plastics things, I didn't really acknowledge that. I think it's also talking, speaking to this use of basic things that are both high culture and low culture at the same time through those objects, which are freely accessible. And also um, some of the ideas that you were saying about um, the user as an extension of the environment, very interesting in terms of thinking through, you know, design problems as the self that is part of the environment. Um, I wonder, but also that their whole their whole system is related to a return to liberation. So I thought in some ways they were sharing that with situationism, this this sort of romantic desire to return to living, you know, these moments that are, you know, revolution through Absolutely. through uh, the, the street, through the objects, through these situations. I'm sure that you know they are trying to sort of hint at what life might be like on the other side of alienation through uh, monetary exchange and the division of labor. They're sort of hinting at what that life might be. Maybe it is hanging out. Maybe, maybe it is um, cashing out on the luxury of post-war Western life and just stopping working. Right. Yeah, thank you so much. And um, does anyone have any com uh, questions to? Well, that's it. <laughs> um, thank you so much. This is a lot to think about. Um, this is a very detailed question, but on the Umberto Eco slide, uh, there's a quote about perhaps people should go door to door area style. And, the, and there's a phrase about Provo and critical resistance. Could you unpack that one a little bit? Like I, I actually didn't, I don't know what it, the, the Provo and critical resistance is, 
but when he was comparing this kind of giddy style of going door to door to um to media forms like newspapers it, i really really wanted to know what kind of sociality of communication he was suggesting yeah well um so i'm not a kind of uh thank you very much for the question i'm not kind of like an echo scholar um you can go back so we this is this is i've extracted this from um a lecture that almost certainly ufo heard and you know so my and the reason that i'm associating it with ufo is that my sense would be something like this that what echo is saying is that um the center of ideology and its production can move from sort of official industrial and state sanctioned forms like newspapers, um, magazines, television, that it's within all of our capacities to interrupt that flow in everyday life. I think that's the idea of door to door, door to door provo. You know, I mean, there's a sort of lot of romanticization, of course, at the time around um guerrilla warfare that um we can sort of take charge of resistance ourselves in small cells from the bottom up and that one of the ways i guess that he's saying that you can do that is to disrupt the sort of monologue of capitalism uh, not by going and working for it but yeah the door-to-door -door thing or in bambarissa's case uh maybe he set up a disco and the decor of the disco doesn't make sense and it seems to be implying something about um europe's dependency on oil wars you know so and it's but and, and that's and it's interesting isn't it because it's it's a very kind of open invitation to reflect that maybe does does it maybe work better in that context than as some opinion piece in a, in a newspaper maybe it is something more lived but does that kind of work as an explanation i mean i can definitely see how um I don't know, like with like Gramsci kind of talks a lot about concrete experiences and um, how people relate to each other and the structure of civil society. And so I can imagine that, that, yeah, like the kind of sociality and relations that you engender something like this would be more powerful than an op-ed piece. I guess this is the second question. So we you don't have to answer it if you don't want to, someone else can ask. But I guess the question I have is like, if, uh, you know, I see, I see something like structure of feeling as um, something that's produced out of the social forces of production that has not yet been kind of named, but is like evident in arts and literature, Raymond Williams idea. And so like, how do we, how do you see these like ephemera, uh, these kind of like ephemeral events as, do you see them as potentially having power in against the wave of like structured affects that are um, are coming through not just op-ed pieces but like production life life in neighborhoods that are structured by capitalism like can it gain enough force <laughs> well i mean uh, the you know the the herbo ephemery are you know very much at the moment they're about resistance to the vietnam war you know, maybe not so dissimilar to any number of protests going on around the world. But, you know, within a year to be in doing things with a disco, that does seem to sort of relocate to, to I'm trying to answer your question here. But let's say, you know, in the the commodity form of like leisure, go into a nightclub. And it does seem to sort of uh disrupt that to sort of get into a process of um of production there around entertainment and possibly sort of turn it back round i have to say i mean although nothing for me compares with mancuso's loft party that's the one i really cannot stop thinking about in in which you know exchange has nearly kind of disappeared sorry yeah 
Maya? I was hoping to kind of jump on that a little bit because, um, so Simon, I was wondering if you could talk about this through autonomism and Italian autonomism and Lazzaroto through uh, Tiziana Terranova's interpretation of him and debt. And maybe instead of talking broadly about the structures, talking about the plastics and the idea of the inflatables as not exactly ephemeral, but um, kind of, and not even chimeric, but a material form that's soft. And, and so it's something in between. And it brings something, if you look at Italian autonomism, it's a totally different theory from Gramsci in some ways that really introduces a lot, like it provides a base for what you're talking about in terms of uh, materialism. And so I'm wondering if you're going to the autonomists, and here I'm thinking also of the work of, of Coral Pareto Serres, who's, who's working on Silvia Federici and um, 3D modeling. So I'm just thinking, you know, are you working through any of the autonomist theories? Well, um, what a great question. Okay. And I, um, so hold on, I'm, I'm trying to get to a set of slides that I had here somewhere. Um, so on the one hand, one, one of the things that, that, that I've been doing in this paper, it's a little bit of a sort of grab bag of theories where I'm trying to sort of find ways of talking about and thinking about UFO. So maybe, you know, uh, theoretically, it's not as well resolved as it should be. Also, you know, Italy isn't my special area. I kind of approached this originally because um, of the affinities with Archigram. And I was asked, well, you know, coming up and US counterculture where I kind of do know my way around a little better. So one of the things that I'm trying to do is to say, well, here's what's distinct about Italian approaches. So I can't go very, very far down the line, although I'm hugely interested of being able to answer a question about the sort of details of um, Italian autonomous theory. However, I was thinking about autonomy. and Autonomy was um, an idea in circulation amongst neo-avant-garde at the time. But I think work has to be done to unpack different understandings of what autonomy is. And I feel that there are at least three understandings of autonomy moving through our architecture and design amongst neo-avant-garde in the 1970s. One of which, which is the one that became preeminent is actually about disengagement, as I've put it here, with social revolution. So over in New York, with the New York Five, they are trying to disengage architecture and design from any direct correlation with social revolution and society. As Peter Eisenman, the architect, uh, who's is the de facto leader of this group, put it once, is it possible, he says, for me to go to a dinner party and just talk about architecture? and not to have to talk about the state of the world. So he was asking for a sort of neo-Kantian autonomy there in which art can function on its own terms without constantly being um, at the mercy of competing political and social forces. Um, Eisenman wanted to interview Global Tools and then lost interest. So I, you can see from this memo that they had arranged to do an article in Opposition's Eisenman's magazine and then uh, that, that went away. Right, another form of autonomy. There's a sort of autonomy in US counterculture that um, ends up basically in a sort of, well, uh, it sort of ends up in survivalism in the States where you say, well, I'm autonomous, I'm a sovereign, I'm a sovereign being, and I've got a year's supply of dried food and I'm going off the grid. And that is a mode of autonomy that is being hailed by the whole earth catalog at the time and global tools are direct they are they are trying to do initially an italian whole earth catalog and it, uh, i mean i always thought the whole earth catalog was like one of the most interesting things that i'd ever seen in so many ways and then global tools is like in some ways that's even more interesting um so 
two forms of autonomy. And then I think um, this third autonomy, which I'm conjecturing is coming. Um, and I've put it here, defining designers as workers like any other and trying to claim for themselves the dignity of socially defined work. Um, so, yeah, we know that I think Benazzi is in, in contact with them and it does seem to be a very formative uh, influence at the time. That still, though, hasn't probably answered your question. But... Okay, thank you. I've got a question there and there. Yep. Yeah, sure. Um, so my question is building off what Lisa, uh, Professor Cartwright was talking about um, before. So I have been, so I have long been interested in the body affect and space, and that ends up permeating in my work, even if it's in more indirect way, ways. Most recently, um, my work is about Celia Federici, um, the Marxist body and connections to machine learning and witchcraft. So um, that's where the question about autonomism came from. And I was wondering if you see if if the you see any other overlap between UFO and the feminist Italian movements at the time. I'm um, I'm originally from Spain. And culturally speaking, there's a lot of overlap, but not during this time, right? Any possibility for these types of movements in Spain at the time had to happen under the covers. Um, so they're not, it's coming up, but they're not studied um, very much, right? At least not in mainstream culture. Yeah. Well, I, I can't wait to sort of see more of that, that work. Um, you know, on the one hand, something like UFO or any of the groups that I've written about, situationists, archigram and whatever, they're, they're, they're great and they're high profile and whatever. But I am weary of talking about men, I've got to say. And um, here, I mean, it is, I don't know where, the, where my slides are. So Patrizia Cameo was, I think, maybe the only female member of UFO. It's, it's, a, it's a male dominated discourse and also adult dominated. I mean, so, so in other words, by, by that point, you sort of excised the whole realm of social relations formed across generations and between genders there's not much addressing of that going on I mean, it's, to the degree to which it's a disco i think you know we kind of probably have a sense of what the relationship is between a lot of the party goers there but global tools does seem to try to figure this out in its retreats so you've got children being brought into activities there um both sexes, but it is, it's a, it's a male dominated thing. Um, I feel like I've got an adjunct thought there though, about a possible, re possible way of thinking about this in relation to feminism, but it's, it's a, I will answer the point, the, the question kind of negatively. I don't see that high a value being placed on feminist thought at the time. And in that way, it's, it's, it's dated. As I said at the beginning of the talk, it's problematic. And this isn't the only exclusion. I mean, if we were to go back here. Oh, sure. I mean, it's referencing um, excluded labouring bodies, but they remain excluded. And this remains a sort of white northern Mediterranean space. So it's all illusion in which the exclusion is maintained. So it's still, it's still not there. It's still nowhere near there. But, you know, 50 years ago. Can I go? Thank you. Thank you, Simon, for this great talk. Um, I was wondering, uh, maybe going off this last point, um, how you might also, another way into the plastic and the oil 
might be this um, global contextualization, which posits this surrealism that is so prevalent in this work as a function of, in a way, the decolonization moment, as an inability to deal with that. It seems like maybe Fanon is a great maybe figure here in the background, right? Because uh, it's a kind of psychosis, maybe, I don't know, uh, of an inability to come to terms with this. That I, I wanted to tie that as a provocation uh, to the fact that, I mean, what's really fascinating about this work is just how um, pregnant this work is with what we have today in architecture, right? So images like this, work like this, that takes on board ontological design, that takes on board performance studies that takes on board um, a really radical rethinking of what design is, is really in a way uh, very close to uh, the hegemony of the discourse, right? So we see this in uh, architecture biennials, right? So the work of Andres Jaque, for example, who writes a lot, I don't know if you know his work. Uh, he writes a lot of, on about performance and about ontological design, uh, is featured prominently in biennials, uh, so there's there's a kind of, uh, in a way, this kicks off for me a moment uh, that we are still in. And so I'm, I'm wondering uh, if there's a thread there between the fact that we haven't managed to do any decolonization of the discipline, really, uh, the fact wh whether there's a through line there or whether it's just me. And what do you make of the fact that this work has really been recuperated, radically recuperated in the, within the discipline, in my opinion? I don't know if you agree with that, but I do think that uh, ontological design has become way too much of, of a big basket and has has become a way of domesticating uh, maybe the radical promise, and the radical questions and the contradictions, right, that, that are uh, so present here. I could say it. he's the expert. <laughs> Actually, being asked about how to how to describe it. Well, you know, here's one thing I'm going to do. I'm I'm downstream. How about we? I'm I, you go upstream for this. It's a bit like with Umberto Eco. I'm not going to be able to justify. Uh, I'm not going to be able to justify the nuances of Echo's thought. Um, if I would say my favorite uh, sources, while almost inscrutable, um, I love the, the the provocations of work by des designers like Tony Fry and Anne Marie Willis. And there, you know, they are they are writing books and articles, really trying to unpack what ontological design entails. I would try and put it this way then that very, very crudely, if design tends to sort of focus uh, on the production of objects, you know, nicer phones, nicer computers, nicer chairs, nicer buildings, ontological design focuses on um, an enhanced and rethought relationship between the entities of the world, people, other species, um, our environment, you know, it can be sort of objectless. And in that, you know, that then uh, correlates with other things that we are trying to uh, figure out right now, decoloniality, a deeper sort of sustainability, what Tony Fry refers to as sustainment. Anything that maintains life is sustainment. Anything that does not sustain life is not sustainment. Um, transition, how you get to that future. Uh, but so that that would be my stab at a sort of uh, a, a primer on on this area. And the reason that I see UFO as an interesting sort of precursor to that is, you know, there are objects. We've got these planters slash wagons in this, and the, but mostly it is as, a, as, a, as I'm as I'm trying to argue, it is about a situation design setting up the possibilities for a different sort of relationship with each other, and for a relationship during which we might 
reflect on what really it is that governs the relationships between people and bodies and different areas of the world and other species. Now, the, the first part of the question, which is one that I'm really, really pleased that you've raised here, it is unbelievably awkward. Are we, in talking about decoloniality and ontology and whatever, are we trying to recuperate? In other words, are we trying to reclaim the threat to the discipline by saying, well, we can get on that and we can, we can hire different sorts of folks Professor Irani and I were talking a, bit, a little bit about, about this over lunch. We were also talking about the importance of um, speaking frankly about things. And th there is nothing more awkward for me right now in the discipline than how we um, tackle two things, really. One is how we do acknowledge and register this moment in which, in a sense, our discipline has been called out. I mean, I've I've got a phone in my pocket, which is the most one of the one of the high points of world industrial design history, that at the same time is alienating me utterly from the so-called artisanal miners of the Congo, uh, who have um, produced for that phone the rare earth metals that will make it vibrate to say this talk is finished. You know, we are being called out. So then we what? We turn around and say, well, no, 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 no. We can, we can figure this out. We can, we can build better relationships. We can hire in more diverse ways. So I've got a couple of thoughts, if I can. If I, can. I, don't wanna, I don't know what, how we are for time. One is, oh, good grief, we're here again. Three quarters of what we were of what we're now talking about had already been talked about by the by the mid 70s at which point there is um, a turn in the economy towards neoliberalism designers suddenly are recalled from the field where they've been doing whatever that is and digging things or whatever global tools were doing sotsas here's the call he goes back and produces tremendous product design again and everything's on again. Like it's a go-go economy. We get star architects and celebrity designers. And it's almost as though what we knew in the 60s and 70s gets forgotten, or we get lulled into another dream where it's like everything's going to be okay, folks. Um, and it's as though in the last few years, all of us, and certainly since 2020, but maybe 2016, have, it's like waking up from the dream and it's like, Oh, wow, it's not okay. And in fact, for example, an environmental crisis or a crisis of inequality of unprecedented historic proportions unfolded while we were shopping. So now we're going to get onto it. Corollary to that question is people in the meantime have been surviving, have been doing design that we will now go and label ontological. And we now say, well, we really want to hire you. But what does a department like mine have to offer such people? Hopefully resources, money, incomes, pensions, bargaining rights, 3D printers, an office. It's not a bad deal, actually, being, <laughs> being UC faculty. And hopefully we can extend that invitation to more people. But the fact that uh, tremendous design has been happening outside of our purview all of this time suggests that, they, that that design didn't need us. David Mancuso didn't need us. You know? And, and, I, and how, we, how we address that, how I turn my syllabus inside out, who am I to even talk about it? What's my, well, it's not my area of expertise. I was, I've been in an academy. Um, actually, I know we're up on time, so I'll keep this brief. Um, I was going to um, ask a question on the connection between uh, global tools, which I found really fascinating, and the whole Earth catalog, um, but you touched on that toward your last slide. So I guess this is actually, I'm not going to pose this as a question. We can move on, but I, I thought that 
Um, you answered this obliquely in your discussion of Manuel's question. I was just going to ask about the afterlives of these sort of projects. Um, I mean, in retrospect, the whole catalog, uh, the sort of received story of the is uh, it's a stepping stone in California ideology, um, right. or it's it's um, an attempt to do locality in the face of um, some sort of cybernetic construction of globalism that, that doesn't really succeed on those terms. Um, and so uh, I was just going to ask about the afterlives, but I think that that last answer um, touched on this. Well, I mean, very quickly, if I could yeah. answer that, you yeah. know, we know about the afterlife of the whole Earth catalog. I mean, as my friend Fred Turner would put it, you know, counterculture to cyberculture. Um, the afterlife of this, one way of saying is, well, it leads to um, so-called new Italian design. Uh, it's proto-postmodern. Uh, so you will have Ettore Sotsas leading these, uh, you know, groups like Memphis, the design consultancy Memphis, which, you know, that has an immeasurable impact on our fondness for consumer goods, for variety, for pop. Another way, though, is to say um, it's kind of clean forgotten. It gets stuffed in an archive and it's like, oh, that 70s thing. Uh, the best book about so much of this stuff remains Andrea Branz's The Hot House. And it's out of print and it costs like a hundred bucks to get a paperback. And that's why I, that why I was so excited to see colleagues in France and Italy bringing this back so we can think about it again. Well, I'd like to thank you for a really uh, fascinating presentation. I come to this as a sort of urban and regional planner. And, uh, and I like to think about change making. And so this description of the four sort of vectors for that is fascinating. And, and I like art. And, and so, Mike, I want to revisit what, Illy, what uh, Lily brought up, though. Uh, Lily brought up this question about um, door to door. And so my question has to do with that. It's sort of the when I heard her ask that question, so she's sort of searching for a, a theory of change, a, a theory of change, how to uh, bring forth an alternative to capitalism with inside the belly of the beast itself, right? So one of the things I want to ask about that is the immediacy of door to door. Um, how do you begin to sort of bring a messaging at that scale when we're working with a kind of a collective, the science and technology studies would say, socio-technical imaginary or socio-ecological imaginaries, and to un, un, you know, unpack that door to door speaks to kind of a, you know, a, a more of an individualized thing, but I get that. And I think, so this is what I'm asking you is like, it's just a scale issue in a way. And just Absolutely. one, just a couple other things. Cause what I'm thinking here is Wendy Brown's beautiful book, The Undoing of the Demos. And she describes the, neo, the neoliberal stealth revolution, bringing into our socio-technical imaginary and our socio-ecological imaginary, a full bore commodification of all life and living. And that's the thing we're battling against. So I, I guess I'll end with this. Can, the, can stories be an invasive species at the door-to-door -door level? How, how do stories then get sort of you know, brought out to challenge these larger things? And here I'm thinking of David, maybe you could reflect on this, David Corton's book. He says, change the story, change the future. I'm in on that. I believe in the power of story. So just want you to maybe reflect on storytelling. One of the um, things that's that's happened to me of late is, you know, I think the problem was that I kind of grew up in the postmodern moment, and I'm like, ah, narrative and stories, and ah, it's uh, don't people realise it's all about material relations? And one of the things that I've um, begun to realise is, my goodness, the world is controlled by narrative. <laughs> you really. <laughs> really got to get control of the narrative. Um, the other thing that you that you mentioned there is um, scale, scaling up. I think, um, you know, what was it, Bruce Mel? You talk about massive change, and the, the moment you start thinking about that, it's like, okay, I'm getting a migraine. I don't know how to how to do it. But if you can find ways of scaling up, I think that. You, mm. I've I've a nasty feeling that the that the right has figured this out faster than the left. 
the uses of social media um, and so on, uh, completely outmaneuvered. But I do think there is something to be said about the possibility of everyday interactions and kindness and modeling different ways of um, being with each other. The situationists used to say, our ideas are in everybody's minds anyway, which I think is very powerful. I mean, I think a lot of us do want things to be different. And you can see people sort of interrupt in that every day anyway. They just, you know, how a Starbucks worker is trained to talk to you about, and how is your day going? And if you can actually, instead of just going, yeah, okay, uh, actually engage. And, you know, do we actually, it's like, do you actually want to do this? Should we actually talk about how the day's going? Because I would love to. And people respond to that. You can, you can sort of, you can get that, you can get that going. And I think maybe you can um, scale up from, from there. Um, maybe there's a sort of design equivalence of that sincerity and, and kindness. Everybody's suffering. We know this. Thank you so much for a really exciting talk, Professor Sadler. Um, it really gets back to a lot of the questions that we have here in the design lab about activism and also kind of links to, in my mind, to um, the work of Christina Visperas that we'll hear from in November 30th, just the idea of um, this structure not being about what's sort of serviceable or getting goods out of it, but those sort of fleshiness of structures and softness and um, as an inhabited space. Um, and so we're thinking through this concept of soft, both as conceptual, but also material. Um, so, yeah, I think that's that. Uh, I mean, yeah, there's obviously more I could say about this. Um, but yeah, because it reminds me also of your work in Archigram about this idea of living structures. And it's something I didn't bring up with this idea of the sutaloon and these sort of enclosed spaces that are responding to the person. And that since they're plastic, you know, just this idea of um, the, the person and the environment responding to each other in this way um, and sort of dissolving those boundaries. So I really want to thank you on behalf of the design lab and the students and faculty here and everyone on Zoom, I think there are no other questions on the Zoom. Yes, uh, so next week, Chris, and also this is also tying us into next week because we'll be looking at um, constructed sit uh, situations, but performance space and um, the idea of all people as sort of performers and actively participating with theater, not necessarily as entertainment, Today, you kind of brought up this idea of sort of the capacity of for theater as revolution. And next week, we'll be hearing from Christopher Cool. Professor Christopher Cool is uh, in the theater and dance department here at UC San Diego, and he's a theater, dance, opera, and installation artist working in lighting and seating, uh, scenic design. And then we'll also be hearing from Professor Franceli Sibrian, who is assistant professor in the Fowler School of Engineering, who will talk to us about ubiquitous design. Um, for neurodiverse children. So please uh, hope you can all join us next week, uh, not next week, November 9th uh, at 4 p.m. And um, thank you again for tuning in. Thank you, everybody.